Hey, good morning and happy Tuesday. I'm coming at you today with a video about early modern Japan and early modern China. And I'm going to start with Japan. So we're going to pick up our story about Japan in 1467, and this is during a period known as the Warring States area. Uh, this is really a period of constant internal warfare and anarchy, and it disrupted all of Japanese society. Uh, the country is technically run by an emperor, but there's also this warlord known as a shogun who is running the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, by this point in time, the emperor is really just a figurehead. Uh, below the shogun are lords known as daimyo. And these daimyo, or these feudal lords, they own the land that the peasants work on. Uh, controlled by the daimyo are samurai. The samurai are the soldiers of the daimyo. And each daimyo has its own group of samurai. It has its own army. And a samurai, it's an elite soldier who serves as the backbone of the Japanese military. Now, the Warring States era, it's going to start because the power of the Ashikaga shogunate begins to collapse. Uh, the Ashikaga shoguns never gain control of all the daimyo. They don't control all the lords, just most of them. And some of the daimyo are going to begin fighting back against the government for control of the country. Uh, there's also an increase in trade with China, which means that there's this desire for greater local economy. Now, the Warring States era, it doesn't end until the rise of three great leaders, uh, Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now, let's start first with Oda Nobunaga, and he's going to be in control from 1578 to 1582. So just to be sure, that's not his lifespan. That's how long he was in control of Japan. Now, Oda Nobunaga, he's the head of the powerful Oda clan, and by the late 1500s, he was the most powerful daimyo. He was more powerful than what the shogun was. And he is seen as the first of the great unifiers in Japanese history. Now, in 1573, uh, Nobunaga challenges the shogun Ashikaga Yoshiaki to uh, battle. And Nobunaga is going to beat the shogun's army in battle. That drives Yoshiaki from the capital of Kyoto, and that officially ends the Ashikaga shogunate. And uh, Oda Nobunaga is going to be given the power of the government by the emperor, and he's going to become the next shogun. After gaining the support of the emperor, uh, Nobunaga is going to continue to challenge the other daimyo and continue to challenge the other clans for complete control of Japan. Um, Nobunaga, he's going to end up committing ritualistic suicide, known as seppuku, when he is surrounded by enemies inside of a temple. Uh, he would rather die an honorable death than be captured. So that brings us to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who's going to reign from 1582 to 1598. Now, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, he's originally a peasant. He's not upper class and he's not a lord. But he's going to become the second in command to Oda Nobunaga. And after Oda Nobunaga commits seppuku, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi is going to continue to unite Japan. Uh, some of the things that Toyotomi Hideyoshi does that are really important, he initiates something called the Great Sword Hunt. Uh, samurai are going to be required to prove their noble descent. And if the samurai can't prove their nobility, and if they can't prove they have sufficient wealth, they're disarmed and they're forced back into the peasantry. About 95% of all samurai are going to be disarmed and forced into peasants. Following the Great social, uh, Sword Hunt, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, he attempts to freeze the social classes, which means he's going to prohibit the samurai from quitting, and they must remain in the services of all the daimyo. In 1592, Toyotomi Hideyoshi makes his worst mistake. In 1592, Hideyoshi invades Korea. Um, he's not able to achieve victory, and it really damages his reputation. Uh, after Hideyoshi dies in 1592, he leaves his young son Hideyori to become the new shogun. But because Hideyori is only five, um, he's not able to rule. So Toyotomi Hideyoshi 
had set up a regency for his son Hideyori. Uh, there was a series of advisors who were supposed to control the country until Hideyori became of age. Now, two of those advisors were a guy named Tokugawa Iesu and Ishida Mitsunari. Now, very shortly after this regency is set up, Tokugawa Iesu begins to seize power from uh, Ishida Mitsunari and the technical shogun Hideyori. Uh, eventually, this power grab is going to be challenged by other daimyo, and that's going to lead us to the Battle of Sekigahara, which is one of the most important battles of Japanese history. And this battle happens on October 21st, 1600. Uh, the armies of the Tokugawa clan are going to go against the armies of the Ishida clan. And the Tokugawa clan is outnumbered. Now, the battle happens southwest of Osaka. Uh, there's some plains there near a village called Sekigahara. And there's a heavy downpour. The heavy downpour ends, and it's just a muddy field that's going to be left. Now, what Ishida doesn't know is that Tokugawa Iesu has made deals with some of his allies, offering them land in exchange for switching sides. Uh, during the battle, a few of these allies did change sides, and that leads to victory for Tokugawa Iesu. I'm going to skip this video just because it doesn't make sense for us to do. So let's go straight into the Tokugawa era. Um, after winning the battle of Sekigahara, Tokugawa Iesu is going to become the new shogun, and he's only going to rule from 1603 to 1616, but it's a very busy 13 years. Uh, to, uh, Tokugawa Iesu, he's going to completely reorganize Japan. The capital is moved from Osaka to Edo, and Edo is today Tokyo. Uh, he does that because Edo was his, basically, headquarters. Uh, he's going to take the lands from his defeated enemies and rearrange where all the daimyo live so that his closest allies live next door to him and his enemies live the furthest away. And then he's going to continue that sword hunt and further limit who can serve as a sam samurai. Beyond that, daimyo are only allowed to marry with permission of Tokugawa Iesu. Daimyo are only allowed to repair their castles with permission of Tokugawa Iesu. Uh, the wives and the children of these daimyo have to live in Edo, and a daimyo is required to live there every other year. Now, if they don't do that, they're killed or they're removed off of their land, so they have to obey. There are going to be some new laws that are passed to control the courts, the temples, the shrines, the daimyo themselves, and most of these laws are going to be based on the idea of loyalty and honor. Um, there's even a national policy of seclusion that's adopted in 1613 that bans all foreigners, other than Chinese and Dutch, from visiting Japan. Even Japanese themselves are not allowed to leave the islands. If they do, and they come back, they're killed. This seclusion policy is going to be kept in place until 1854. Now, the Tokugawa economy. Uh, Japan is going to experience a really long period of peace and seclusion, but there are going to be some problems. Because Japan cuts itself off from the rest of the world, by 1700, the economy is approaching its limits due to population increases. Um, there's heavy use of contraception and there is infanticide to control the population. Uh, there is a strong internal market. Uh, it, there's commerce that's flowing throughout Japan, but there's no industrialization. Without industrialization, there are real limits to what can be done. Eventually, the Japanese economy slows to a halt. And by 1850, when Europeans come to Japan, Japan, for the most part, looks the same as it did in the late 1600s, early 1700s. All right, China is next. And with Chinese history, we very often go by dynasties. And the dynasty we're going to pick up on is the Ming dynasty that was in power from 1368 to 1644. Uh, the Ming dynasty, they're going to be the, um, the dynasty that takes over after the Mongols are defeated. 
and the Ming are going to get rid of the Mongol influence. They're going to return China to kind of like a Chinese driven or a Chinese culturally driven country. And eventually a vassal state of the Ming, a, a, a technically a separate kingdom, but controlled by the Ming are going to conquer China. And that vassal state was known as Manchuria. The leaders of the Manchuria vassal state were known as the king, Q-I-N-G. Now, the uh, king emperors, they're going to conquer Taiwan, and they're going to expand Chinese influence into Central Asia. So they're going to expand the area that the Chinese control. Now, as far as commerce goes, there is some similarity between the Ming and the Qing. Uh, the early Ming emperors, they believed in isolationism, and they ran an agrarian agricultural-based economy. But by the mid-1600s, trade starts to grow, and that's just simply because of a rise in population. And when trade starts to grow in the mid-1600s, there's this commercial revolution that leads China to be the most commercialized non-industrial society in the world. There are these private banks known as Shangxi banks that open throughout China. And these are banks that are owned by wealthy merchant families. They facilitate trade and they extend to credit and these private banks are eventually going to spread to Singapore, Japan, and even Russia. Most of the growth in China happens in these intermediate market towns. In these intermediate market towns, they provide a link between local markets and the large capital cities. Uh, family structure, still based on Confucian traditions where women are expected to obey men, and women are physically restricted. And there's this practice called foot binding that becomes common. And I encourage you to take a moment to look up and research foot binding because the pictures are absolutely stunning. Both the Ming and the Qing dynasties, they have strong central government and strong competent emperors. The emperor allows his administration to run the government while he himself focuses on cultural and religious things. Education is based on the traditional teachings of Confucius, and education is seen as the most important aspect of Chinese culture and history. Um, edu this education is going to spread throughout China, and it's because of the civil service exam that's needed to gain governmental positions. In China, you have to pass tests, and you have to be the best of the best to be hired by the government. It's not who you're related to or how much money you have. Now, the way the civil service exam worked in China, a candidate would be screened at a local office, and then they would take a local county exam. If the local county exam was passed, then they became a member of the gentry, basically this middle class, and they were then eligible to take the provincial exam. Uh, however, the provincial exam is only given once every three years. If the provincial exam is taken and passed, then the test taker has to pass what's called the Metropolitan Exam, and that also was given once every three years. And that provincial exam was hard, but the Metropolitan Exam, fewer than 90 people took that test and passed it every time it was given. Now, what about relations with the West in China? Uh, Europeans first come to China in large numbers in the 1500s. Uh, a large number of these Europeans are missionaries, and the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, are the ones who really come to China. Uh, for example, uh, Matteo Ricci, he masters the Chinese language, and he shares ideas about Western math and science. And Jesuits, such as Matteo Ricci, are going to compare Jesus to Confucius and say, yeah, they're kind of the same thing to convert uh, Chinese to Christianity. And to make it easier for the Chinese to understand what's going on, the Jesuits are actually going to hold Christian services in the local Chinese languages. Eventually, some missionaries are going to complain to the Pope about the Chinese language services. And some of these missionaries are going to complain about the use of ancestor worship. And the Pope is going to say, hey, we can't do that anymore. And as a response, the Emperor Kangxi 
is going to order an end to the preaching of Christianity in China and throw out all the missionaries. Now, there are some Europeans that come primarily to trade. There are some restrictions put on them, but they're still going to come to trade. Uh, the trading res restrictions are known as the Canton system. And what that really meant is that Europeans could only trade outside the city walls of the city Canton. Any other trading in China by Europeans was illegal. Uh, Europeans, specifically the British East India Trading Company, they're going to trade tea and silk and give gold and silver to the Chinese merchants. And we will talk more about that in a future lecture. All right, that's it. Nice and short, about 15 minutes. I appreciate you watching. If you have any questions, send me an email. We will see you soon.